Good evening, I'm Jose Cardenas. Find out about a project producing conversations around Chicana and Latina issues, plus an exhibition featuring contemporary Cuban art, and what you can expect to see at this year's Phoenix College Latino Film Festival. All this coming up next on Horizonte. Funding for Horizonte is made possible by contributions by the Friends of Eight, members of your Arizona PBS station. Thank you for joining us. Entre Nosotras is a collaborative project producing conversations around Latina and Chicana issues, social justice movements, and culture. With me tonight to talk about this project are Ilana Luna, Assistant Professor of Latin American Studies at the ASU School of Humanities, Arts, and Cultural Studies, and Jessica Del Rincón, Professor Luna and Jessica are both members of Entre Nosotras. Welcome to both of you. Thank you for having us. And, and you were both in, as I understand, at the beginning of Entre Nosotras. Tell us about that. Why was it formed and, and, and what, what are you trying to do? Well, you well I can speak yeah. uh, to more directly on that question. I was in a class, a women's studies course called Gender on the Borderlands, um, taught by another faculty member who is a part of the collective. Um, and we were really discussing issues of gender, identity, and how those issues kind of come together in terms of uh, the border and, tr and translocal issues. And we're really interested in, uh, in bringing awareness around these topics and creating events that promote these understandings in Phoenix. Did you feel there was a void, that there was nothing out there that, that was doing that? Definitely, we did feel that there was a void. There is a larger um, event and discourse kind of going on in Phoenix in terms about undocumented and immigration issues, but nothing that specifically focuses on gender and how these issues of immigration specifically um, affect women. So that's where definitely the collective came about. It's a, the collective was addressing women, um, gender, and immigration. So. And Professor Luna, you've had about four events yep. or so, so far. Give us a sense for the flavor of the events and, and how it is that they feel the need that Jessica was talking about. Well, uh, like Jessica was saying, uh, we wanted to focus, really, there, there are a lot of people in Phoenix, we don't want to make any claims that there's nothing going on here because it's the opposite of true, but what we saw as a need was to look at ideas and thoughts and identity politics and the ways in which people engage art as a form of activism and, and express you know, gender identities that maybe don't get as much airtime or as much um, space. And so the first event that we had was a film screening with uh, filmmaker Aurora Guerrero, uh, and we screened her film Mosquita y Mari mm -hmm. at the Tempe campus, at the West campus, and she gave a master class as well. Uh, and uh, the next big event that we did, we held a, a concert by a collective group of uh, women uh, performers of Son Jarocho called Entre Mujeres and came out from LA. Um, and we held the concert at Civic Space and we then had a workshop that built into a multi-day workshop on uh, performance in Son Jarocho. And, uh, and we're talking about a particular style of dance. It's this particular style of, 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 um, of music from Veracruz, Mexico and uh, how it has sort of transformed as it has a conversation across borders. Uh, Entre Mujeres uses the term translocal, and it's a term that we really like. Um, and and then, let me ask you, yes. this, why the focus on art? Why the focus on art? Well, partially it's because of our personal interests. I mean, this grew as a very sort of, um, uh, self-generated, what are we interested in? What would we like to see more of? What kind of events you know, do we wish we could go to here in Phoenix? And that's, it's been driven by things that, that we think uh, will speak to a, a larger community. Um, and so artivism, this term of activism in art, is, is another one of the terms that we really like to use as we look at, at what, um, what conversations can come out of bringing artists into a community and asking the community to then engage with those artists. And one of the goals that we've had in these, these first four events that we've done is to create a space where groups of people from Phoenix or from the greater Phoenix area who might not otherwise run into each other 
have a common ground and have some kind of uh, space to have a dialogue. So it's not just, oh, there's this cool thing we're going to go to and we're going to sit th for two hours and watch an event or we're going to go to a gallery and we're going to look and we're going to go home. We're asking to engage and we're asking people to, to really en enter into a dialogue. And uh, we have some, some diehard fans that have been coming to all of our events. Well, and, and Jessica, how successful do you think the group has been in, in meeting the goal that Professor Luna was talking about? I think so far, well, we've been uh, active for about two years now, and we've been definitely been successful in growing. Um, we've been gaining more popularity throughout Phoenix, um, more followers. And, and the interesting thing is that we're seeing the same groups of people attend our events. Um, we're getting more word around ASU campuses, and it's definitely showing in, the term, in terms of what support we're receiving by donors, um, whether that be ASU, various departments around campus, various grants throughout the community, different community organizations, or also such as the City of Phoenix as well. So, so let's talk about the most recent event. You brought in a documentarian. Correct. And, and, and the film itself was pretty interesting. It, it was very interesting. And I thought, I think it brings a, the film was about Ufresina's revolution, um, directed by Luciana Kaplan. And it was about an indigenous women running for the House of Representatives in Mexico. Um, and I think that the film brought an interesting issue to Phoenix um, and brought an interesting topic of discussion that probably isn't really explored um, and, and isn't, that information isn't accessible to mainstream audiences. So, so uh, Professor Luna, one of the things that was particularly important about this most recent presentation, uh, you and I talked about this mm -hmm. off camera, uh, was the fact that, that Luciana Kaplan, Kaplan mm -hmm. um, uh, is, is Latina. I mean, we, we talked about right. Latina, Chicana, and, and, and you made the point that it, it's a broader experience that you want to make sure people are exposed to. Absolutely, and, and we, as we were talking about some of the events that have happened so far, there's, uh, there's sort of a natural relationship with Mexico because we're in the borderlands. Mm -hmm. but. Uh, it's important to us to sort of conceive of this notion of people whose identities are, are, are fluid. So people affiliate themselves with national identities, but with larger movements as well. So what was really interesting about Luciana, who stayed with us for several days, um, is that she was born in Argentina and uh, fleeing the dictatorship in the, in, the, in the late 70s in Argentina, her family moved to Mexico where she has you know, lived since then. And so part of her uh, master class or her, her workshop that she gave, she really talked about the ways in which that hybrid identity changes how somebody engages civically with the communities that they're in. And so that's absolutely something that we want to highlight and we want to continue to build on that um, because we find that a lot of times, especially in mainstream media, there's this notion of what Chicana or what Latina is. And that's kind of what we're pushing back against. So we want to create spaces where we think about people in different ways. Uh, and so two of our events, the Mosquita y Mari event, Aurora Guerrero's film, and Monica Palacios, the playwright who came and did uh, a one-woman performance and then a workshop on performance and storytelling, both had uh, examined sort of the queer immigrant experience, which is, uh, you know, something that doesn't get a lot of um, So what you're press. doing is you're exposing people to really a, a broad range of... of right. Of of uh, experiences. Um, uh, Jessica, we're almost out of time. If people want more information about Entre Nosotras and, and the things that you guys can be doing in the future, how would they get that? They can look on our Facebook page, Entre Nosotras, um, and we'll also put out information via ASU news outlets as well. That's great. Thank you both for joining us on Horizonte. It was a pleasure having you Thank with you us so tonight. Much.
In 1998, the ASU Art Museum presented the first exhibition of contemporary art from Cuba organized by a U.S. museum. Contemporary Art from Cuba, Irony and Survival on the Utopian Island, Rhythm and History is the first reconsideration of the museum's Cuban holdings in a decade, featuring new acquisitions along with highlights from the original show. Former ASU Art Museum Director Marilyn Zeitlin is here to talk about this exhibition. Marilyn, welcome back to Horizonte. You've been on here before to talk about events such as this. Um, it, it, the, the collection itself is, is fairly rich in terms of its quality, and it's almost a shame that it's taken 10 years for us to get it back out. Well, there are lots of other things in that collection, but I'm very pleased to see it out, kind of breathing again, as Cuba moves back into the news. Uh, one collect, uh, correction, though, it was 1998. 1998. Yes. And, and when it first uh, showed, um, Cuba, as you indicated, was much different. But let, let's talk about what we saw at that time. What, what, what uh, characterized these pieces? I know several of them were donated by um, the Hollies and, and some other prominent art collectors. But, but what would you say is unique about this collection? Well, I, it forms a, a little time capsule reflecting the special period between the time of the collapse of the Soviet Union and the time that Raul Castro took power from Fidel. So it, it's even, most of the work is from the 90s when the special period was at its worst, when all this privation with the collapse of the Soviet Union and Cuba as a client state of the Soviet Union, suddenly 30% of their GDP was disappeared instantly. 90% of their fuel was suddenly gone. People were living on sugar and water and riding bicycles. It's largely true. Uh, and I, I went in ni the first time, I went back again, I should say, in 96. And it was very hard to, they fed tourists, but it was bad. So it records a period of uh, real uh, trauma in the country when the revolution, I probably was more directly threatened than any time in its history since 1959. Now we've got several pictures of pieces in the exhibition we want to put up on the screen and talk about them. Uh, this first one here, uh, wh what does that reflect? It looks a little bit like The Wizard of Oz, some of, some of the that, scenes there. That's right. It's by Pedro Alvarez, and the title of it is Homage a Wilfredo Lam. Lam is the, the Michelangelo of Cuban painters. And Pedro shows uh, a jungle scene in a very Disney-esque uh, way. And it's um, because Lam's most important painting in the United States is La Jungla, which is in the Museum of Modern Art. The jungle. Yeah. And so he, then he has this, these little figures on the left and right, little vignettes that are quotations from 18th century a genre painting that prettified the Cuban situation, that makes a kind of saccharine view of prostitution, of, uh, of slavery. And he's taken those and put them in, in, which is a very deep kind of irony. And then, in the midst of it, he's got this big yellow international harvester truck kind of barging in. It's the intrusion of the West the intrusion of the international. So it's this anxiety. We, we, we like being an island, kind of, even though it's put us in a terrible place. And speaking of barges, this next image is of a, of a more like a kayak on bottles. What, what is that supposed this to This is by Cacho, and it, the, the title is Para Olvidar, In Order to, to forget. forget. And the forgetting at that time, this piece is from 1994, the height of the flight of the Balseros the rafters leaving Cuba, 7,000 people left on anything that would float, and countless other people died trying. And so Cacho has created this kayak. It's all, it's very heavy. I'm not sure it would float. And it's not really floating. It's stagnating on these beer bottles. At that time, in order to forget, well, one good way to forget is is to overindulge in, in drinking. There's a lot of drinking in so Cuba at that time. So it symbolized that, that effort. We've got a, another piece on the screen. Tell us about this one. Well, this is similar. It's, it's the whole notion of being an island and all the pluses and minuses. And this is Vecinos, neighbors. And these two modernist buildings float in this tiny swimming pool. 
And they never, they touch, but then they sort of bounce off one another, and there's no one living there. So it's about envy of people next door who might have a little more, which was a very important factor in people's daily life in Cuba. Some, you never showed up in somebody's house at mealtime. And um, yet, it, it's kind of beautiful at the same time. It's idealized. It also is kind of a fusion of Havana and Miami. It's by uh, a team of two artists that call themselves Los Carpinteros. And they now show primarily in Brazil and, and, and elsewhere in the world. They're very successful. Marilyn, uh, we talked a little bit before that this reflects the Cuba of 16 plus years ago. What would we see on the artistic scene there now? The, the focus has changed in a number of ways. First, there, the use of found materials is not, as, is not as necessary. You can imagine if there was no food, there was no printing paper, there was no paint, there was no canvas. Um, so people were using found objects in very clever ways, like the kayak, for example. But um, what's more important, I think, is the shift in the content. Because the privation that was so dire in the special period is now loosening up as um, Raul Castro, as the, the new president, is moving Cuba into a more permissive uh, place. And that's now being reflected in the art. It is. Before so I forget, um, we should say when the exhibition is going to be on display. It's up, I believe, August 26th is the last day. And we've got uh, uh, something on the screen that says March 1 to August 9th. Thank you so much, Marilyn, You're for joining welcome. us to talk about this. It's Thank always, you. always good to have you here. Next week, the Phoenix College Latino Film Festival will be presenting a diverse sample of films from Latin America and the United States. We'll talk about the festival in a moment, but first, here's one of the films you'll be able to watch, El Barrio Tours, Gentrification in Spanish Harlem. This month they send notice of this process. You deserve a super. I, got, I mean, what the hell? She's trying to get me out of here because it's rent control. I'm not running nowhere. This is all I have. Joining me now to talk about this year's Phoenix College Latino Film Festival is Trino Sandoval, founder and director of the festival. Trino, welcome back to Horizonte. Thank you for having me. Uh, this film clip that we just saw, uh, tell us a little bit about the film, and then I want to talk about why it's important to the whole country, even though the focus is on Harlem. Well, uh, El Barrio Tours is a film uh, about gentrification in, in Spanish Harlem in New York. Uh, directed by Andrew Padilla, who is going to be attending the festival uh, to answer questions after the, the viewing of the film. It's an important film because gentrification does not only occur in New York. I mean, it's a phenomenon that is happening in most major cities in the U.S. And it's important because many times it displaces uh, minority communities, poor communities, in this case, uh, Mexican and Puerto Rican communities in New York. And, and it, there's some really interesting things going on there. Tell us about that. Well, um, the, what's happening, what's important about this film is that uh, uh, is not only displacing communities that live in the, in the area, but uh, the companies, the developers that are trying to move in, trying to even change the name uh, of the um, Spanish Harlem to something called Es Paja, which is Spanish Harlem, or they want to call it Upper New York, New York Bill, because they want to attract people that will be spending the money in, the, in this new area that is gentrified. And as you noted, it's, it's an issue all over the country. There's a lot of focus these days on San Francisco and what's going on there with the, with the tech workers. Um, uh, you have five other films? Yes, we have five documentary films and one feature film as part of the festival. Let's talk about some of the other ones. Uh, the festival opens on the 29th of April with uh, El Barrio Tours. On the 30th of, of April, we have a film called Las Martas, which is a very interesting documentary film that takes place in Texas about a Chicano community on the border that tries to imitate uh, George Washington Ball by her, his wife, Martha. And it's interesting because it's being kept alive by Chicanas that live in the area as opposed to another community. You know, when I saw the, the clip, my initial thought was that they were, the focus was on quinceañeras, the coming out party for Mexican girls. It, it's similar to that, but the, the focus is that they want to imitate a, a, a ball that took place during the Washington 
Clinton era, which uh, is very interesting. And it's interesting because a lot of families spent a lot of money on, on these balls. Some families spent up to $30,000 just on the gown that the girls wear, which is the equivalent of what a family makes in a whole year in the area. And then you have several pieces from Colombia. We have uh, two films from Colombia. The feature film is called uh, Crab's Trap. It's a film by uh, director Oscar Ruiz. Uh, the film talks about a fisher village uh, in the Pacific part of Colombia and how they're struggling with um, multinational companies that come to overfish the area and they have to find ways of uh, making a living. Uh, the other film from Colombia is called Looking For by um, a very young director by the name of Andrea Said. It's a very personal documentary because it deals with her personal search for her father. She was born in, uh, in London uh, to a Colombian mother and a uh, Pakistani father. So the film tries to trace her mother's uh, roots and her steps in, in London. And, then, and, and it's the young woman looking for her father. Right, yes. Uh, and uh, it's, uh, I mean, it talks about the whole issue of uh, globalization and how people uh, bec go to other countries and they make a new uh, life there and then uh, they come back to Colombia um, with a new life and uh, the result is that the young woman doesn't meet her father. And what, what other films are people going to be able to see? Another interesting film that I recommend is going to be, it's called uh, El Diario de Agustín in Spanish, the English translation is uh, Agustín's newspaper. It's a very interesting film, uh, it's a documentary film that deals with the influence of El Mercurio newspaper and their influence and their interesting and illegal tactics, tactics to overthrow the agenda regime. Uh, it's a very clear... In Chile back in the um, early 70s. In right? the early 70s, correct, yes. And their connections with the CIA and with the very elite uh, families in Santiago that were obviously very supportive of Augusto Pinochet, the dictator, against the overthrow of Allende's regime. And is this a, a, a recent film or one that you're, you're bringing in that hasn't been shown here before? I don't believe that particular film has been shown in Phoenix. Um, I, the film, I believe, is from 2000. 12, uh, so I think it's so relatively recent. It is pretty recent, yes. Uh, it's, um, it, uh, the film deals with this group of uh, young university students who are studying journalism, so they did a very extensive research to, to make the film. It's very, very accurate, uh, very informative, uh, and it talks about the particular issue of uh, the overthrow of Allende from a different so, perspective. You know, uh, just the fact that it's Latino Film Festival would imply <coughs> internationalism, but but re that really is true of, of this set of films. You go from London to Colombia to Chile and, and then back home to Phoenix, the last film. Absolutely. I wanted to make sure that we included a film from, from Phoenix. Uh, Lourdes de Vasquez uh, created a film called The Immigration Paradox in 2012. Uh, it has been screened in Phoenix a couple of times, but this is the first time that's going to be screened in its new 90-minute uh, format. She wanted to, uh, she had a few screenings to get feedback from the, the people that side to get a new version that's more feasible to watch in, in festivals and in, uh, in other venues. So it's the first time we're going to watch the shorter version. And of course, Lourdes will be there to uh, answer questions with the uh, audience. And we had her on the show here a, a while back. Um, one of the things you, you mentioned with respect to her and with some of the other folks is there's going to be somebody connected to each movie who will be present to talk about the film. It's one thing we wanted to do this year is to make sure that we had every director of the film present uh, because of financial reasons we're not able to bring all six, but we're going to have four directors present after each screening. The other two, one from Argentina and one from um, Chile, they're not going to be able to be here, but they will be able to talk to the audience via Skype uh, after the screening to answer questions. And, and why is that important? I mean, people go to the movies, they, they enjoy the film. Why is it important to have that kind of dialogue? I, I think people like to know uh, the creative process when about a film. Uh, particular people, uh, students who are uh, studying film, it's very uh, important for them to hear about the creative process, how the film was made. And then uh, for other people, it's important to know um, uh, that the director may answer questions that were not clear throughout the film. Um, and it just, uh, I, I think people are attracted to, to see who made the film. Now, a moment ago, we had on the screen some, some of the details regarding the festival when it's going to be. Uh, I guess one of the other important things is it, it's free. It's absolutely free. Uh, every film is free. And uh, like I said, every director will be present either in person or via Skype. And the film, uh, the festival is going to be held here at the uh, Civic Space uh, in, in downtown Phoenix and also at Phoenix College. The first three films are Civic Space and then and, and the Saturday is, is, is two films. On Saturday we wanted to have a matinee for those people that want to go see an evening perform evening show. So we have a 2 p.m. screening of the Immigration Paradox and then the last film will be a 7 p.m. Uh, Looking For by Andrea Said. 
Srinu Sandoval, congratulations on what appears to be another wonderful film festival, and thanks for joining us on Horizonte to talk about it. Thank you for having me. That's our show for tonight from all of us here at 8 and Horizonte. I'm Jose Cárdenas. Have a good night. Funding for Horizonte is made possible by contributions by the Friends of Eight, members of your Arizona PBS station.